Greetings. Welcome back. Uh, it, we're looking at the end times of the Third Age at this point in our study in the book of Revelation. Uh, we're going to begin looking at the seven seals. Now, in previous studies, we went through a study we called Learning the Bible Crosswise. And then we looked at uh, another one where we, it was entitled The Roadmap of the Ages. And in both of those, we showed that there are a nu numerous uh, instances of, of significant, significant things in the Bible where the pattern of the throne of God is reflected in that there is something divine in the midst of four something else, four things. In the, in the case of the first verse in the Bible, uh, now this is indeed the order of the words in the Hebrew. Uh, in the beginning created God heaven, the heavens and the earth. Uh, and so they are in that order here as I presented now. Adam's dominion, there are four areas of land. Uh, it says that e Assyria is east, it says Eden is west. Havilah and Ethiopia are anybody's guess. Uh, I put Ethiopia in the, in the southern position there because that's where it is relative to Israel. There is no land called Havilah today, so there's no clues there. Now, why do I say Ethiopia is in the south position? Because in the camping order in the wilderness, Reuben was south. Okay, let's see, the temple, uh, there's the four precincts of the temple, ages appointed, there's the Adamic age. See, there's a common thread of all these things. Now, if you look at just these two, the order of the ages appointed and the order of the, the precincts of the temple, uh, and then you just expose the this four sevens in Revelation there, uh, I believe there's a, a correlation of nature and character between these three, the Adamic age, the court of the Gentiles, and the seals. So I believe the nature of rebellion will be reflected in the seals, uh, specifically the uh, heritage of those descended from Adam, the house of Adam. And of course, uh, the trumpets, I believe, will be a time when the Jews will be the focus of that period of the end times. And again, the thunders, uh, even though the pronouncements are made in the sixth trumpet, I believe they take their fulfillment following the rapture of the church, and of course the golden vials they're referred to are par parallel to the Holy of Holies where everything is overlaid with gold signifying royalty and the kingdom age. Now, so here are the, here are the four sevens of Revelation. And I believe the seals do reflect the nature and character of rebellion, a characteristic of the first age and the court of the Gentiles where you didn't have to be a Jew, you didn't have to qualify in any way. Anybody is welcome in the court of the Gentiles in the temple. In Jerusalem during those times before it was destroyed in 70 AD. So, <clears throat> a couple of scriptures I believe pertain to this period of time uh, where the seals, the first four seals are being fulfilled. Uh, Second Thessalonians 2-3 uh, speaks of a falling away um, and the, the revealing of the man of sin. Uh, what's falling away? Well, the apost apostasy is the Greek word and it means uh, defection, apostasy, revolt. Uh, apa is a prepositional prefix meaning away from or from. Astasia is from the Greek word staso which means to stand therefore it means to fall from standing or just away from standing and if you're away from standing you're you're on your can. So let's see. Second Thessalonians what is it? I don't know. Something 11. For this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. Uh, it's a definite article in the Greek, mistranslated a lie in probably a lot of translations because they all kind of copied one another. Now, verse 12, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Why is that significant? It, you remember when we studied the seven letters to seven churches, we got to the sixth letter, the letter to the church in Philadelphia, um, and we said that paralleled a period of time known as the Great Awakening where once the printing press was invented, Bibles were printed in the vernacular of people and people all over the world, every country in the world, uh, the gospel was preached and people came to Christ in droves. Well, that period as it passed, we, we see an apostasy arising and people are choosing what they want to believe now. Do they want to believe uh, in God or do they want to believe the lie? Well, people are choosing and we're going to look at the lie and its four components as we proceed. Now, here are the seven seals in Revelation. Um, the first four, I believe, are characterized by 
uh, rebellion. Uh, the fifth seal depicts souls under the altar and the events associated with them. But I believe it, it, it's, for, it's deeper than that. And we'll get there eventually, but I don't want to tip my hand too much. I don't want to alienate too many people un unnecessarily. Now, <laughs> okay, I guess I just did. Um, so here's the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Um, now, I believe, since they reflect the rebellion of the first age and other things in those parallels we saw earlier, uh, I believe we're going to see the nature of rebellion in these. I believe these four horsemen, the verbiage, supports the view that they represent world domination ideologies. So let's take a look at the first seal and the white horse, and I'll show you what I mean. Um, now, John says, when I saw that when the lamb opened one of the seals, I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four living creatures saying, come and see. Uh, there's four living creatures before the throne. I'll leave it to you to guess which one introduces each one of these first four seals. Uh, okay, verse 2. I saw and behold a white horse. He that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given to him. And he went forth conquering and to conquer. So we're looking for what? Three things. A bow, a crown, and conquering. Now, do you remember this guy? When we studied the seven letters to seven churches, uh, the church of Sardis represented the, or it paralleled the period of church history where uh, King Henry VIII protested against the Roman Catholic teaching of divorce, started his own church so that he could dictate terms. And of course, that's no foundation for a church. That's why nothing is good is said, nothing good is said about the Church of Sardis. They weren't commended for anything by Jesus Christ as he dictated the letter. The other six were. So uh, this was a church arose from rebellion against, well, the Catholic teachings of the day and the Pope. But this was all part and parcel of a humanist movement. A lot of people were protesting against. Uh, the, the, the Roman Catholic Church had become apostate themselves. They had uh, lost sight of the essential doctrines of Christianity, and they were just they'd become bullies, really. And a lot of people were embracing other philosophies to uh, depart, to, to, as a departure from uh, Roman Catholicism. So Henry the Henry the Eighth, he wasn't, uh, he wasn't the first, uh, he was just following a trend. And uh, in 1534, the property of Rome was seized, both their land and their finances. And um, at that time, the longbow was a standard weapon of war in Britain. And this is kind of the uh, departure point from which uh, Britain began to establish themselves as an empire. Now, the crown, what about the crown? Well, that's, the, that's a slam dunk. I mean, they're, they're characterized by their monarchy. Uh, a reference to simply the crown is taken as a reference to, to the uh, crown of England. And he went forth conquering and to conquer. Uh, the British Empire obviously went forth conquering and to conquer. Matter of fact, um, <clears throat> Let's take a look at a few things and maybe even come back here. Um, now, if you look up white supremacy in, in encyclopedia.com, uh, this, I believe, is the opening paragraph. And I'd like to read it because I think it's very poignant. It's, it, it very well characterizes this period of the rise of not only Britain, but all, uh, a, a number of other nations of, in Europe who also felt that white supremacy was... Um, gave them the, well, let's just read. There is a direct correlation between the rise of imperialism and colonialism and the expansion of white supremacist ideology, justifying the changing international order, which increasingly saw Europeans assuming political control over peoples of darker skin color through military force and ideological means such as religion and education. And, um, boy, I couldn't believe it that the, the first opening paragraph of my research just gave me everything I needed. That's exactly what I wanted to present. Now, uh, this is an art, uh, these are excerpts from an article from, written by a guy named Piers Brendan, and I really enjoyed this article. This guy <laughs> really knows how to write. Boy, what a talented writer. Uh, his opening line was, the moral balance sheet of the British Empire is a chaotic mixture of black and red. Red, of course, a double entendre for both uh, the death side of the ledger and blood. Uh, <laughs> brilliant opening line. Uh, now, the second excerpt there, bearers of the white man's burden. See, they considered it the white man's burden. Because they assumed white people were, uh, were superior, they considered it the white man's burden to organize, colonize, educate these people of lesser intelligence and, uh, you know, lesser abilities than white people had, you see. Um, 
and of course that third expert excerpt, uh, imperial callousness towards lesser breeds was commonplace, sometimes apparently condoned by a crude faith in survival of the fittest. So you see how even before uh, Charlie Darwin, as the empire was growing, their rationale was that um, it was the white man's burden to bring to lesser breeds um, the science of, and education and morality of, of their Church of England. <coughs> Boy, how pretentious. Now, uh, George Orwell. Now, this is, these are again lifted from this article, but they're quotes nonetheless. Uh, the empire was a despotism with theft as its final object. That's a, an overall assessment, having um, the, the, the empire now in decline, looking back at its report card. Uh, and of course, T.H. Huxley quoted as saying, evolution could not invalidate morality. Uh, there could be no justification for the Tasmanian genocide or the slaughter of Ad Australian aborigines. And, and he's absolutely correct. correct. Uh, morality is not relative. Morality is absolute. And evolution, just because you have a theory that you're better than everybody, doesn't give you the right to kill other people. Um, Hitler did that, didn't he? Well, so the British. Now, of course, uh, Lord Salisbury, final quote there. If our ancestors had cared for the rights of other people, the British Empire would not have been made. Its purpose was not to spread sweetness and light, but to increase Britain's wealth and power. Here's Charlie Darwin on the 10-pound British note. My wife brought that back from a vacation in uh, England visiting a relative. It speaks worlds about their, uh, his influence on their culture and society and, of course, their actions. Now, we all see the evidence. There are millions, billions of dead things uh, buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. And an atheist, of course, is going to look at that evidence and say, well, there's no God, therefore... It must have evolved. Well, you know, Christians uh, and uh, faithful Jews, of course, are going to look at that, that evidence and they're going to say, well, you know what, there was a worldwide flood, which explains it perfectly. Now, between every theory and its evidences, there is a black box. Uh, how did things evolve? How did uh, things get here? Uh, was it a flood or was it just natural causes over millions and billions of years? Well, unless you can open that black box, you don't know. Well, this guy did. A.E. Wildersmith. Uh, I believe he has three earned PhDs. Um, brilliant man. I heard him speak. He came and did a series of uh, talks at a college I taught at. Uh, and if, you're gonna, if you intend to read this book, have a dictionary handy. So, next time we're going to look at the uh, second seal in our, in our continuing study of the end times of this third age, our series in, on the book of Revelation. God bless. I'm going to call it a day right here and um, bid you adieu.